Hey everybody, and welcome to another live stream of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. Thanks for joining us on YouTube or Facebook or however else you're joining us right now. Uh, you can enter in those questions, whatever questions you have as you go throughout this, this podcast recording, uh, whether they be related to cycling, triathlon, or anything else, go ahead and throw them in there. Uh, we're glad to have you all. Uh, it's the normal crew. Nate's back this week, back from Hawaii. Uh, so we'll get into, uh, it's going to be a normal episode. Um, so we'll get into that, but, uh, before we go any further, we're recording on GarageBand. Is that correct? Producer Bryce? I think we're good there. Cool. All right. With that, uh, let's get into the actual podcast episode. You guys ready to kick it off? Mm-hmm. Cool. Awesome. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> this is delay. Let's do it. All right. Uh, then we'll kick it off. Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. Our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. This is where we answer your cycling and triathlon related questions, and you can submit them at trainerroad.com slash podcast. We'll come through those questions, uh, build up a list of questions that we feel like we can address for y'all that week, something that also hopefully is interesting and insightful. And then with that, uh, we'll answer those questions on the podcast every week. So once again, trainerroad.com slash podcast. Uh, also there, if you don't know, and you're just listening to this podcast, we stream this live too. Uh, so we're streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. So you can just find us on youtube.com slash trainer road, or just search for trainer road on Facebook and you can find us there. And, uh, you can submit questions live and we even answer some of those questions after the podcast recording. So, uh, before we get any further and into the questions, Nate, you were in Hawaii. I was on a vacation two weeks, two weeks. And you, but you, you brought your bike. Too. I did. Um, <laughs> I listened to the podcast while I was riding. Yeah. So I heard everything that you both said. <laughs> we knew you were there. I just re-listened to it. Uh, there okay. was something about uh, Chad did say Nate's there. Not so specific, but we're here in our basements toiling away. Um, there we are. I, I just want to say why. So I, I went to West Maui for people who haven't mm-hmm. been there. The reason why I didn't bring my TT bike is one, there were no brakes on it. Remember? Yes. <laughs> it's oddly enough, it's actually it, the the brakes that came on that bike. If you have a Cervelo P5 and you don't have the Magura hydraulic brakes, you probably know about this. They're problematic, really hard to adjust. Mm-hmm. So you switch to tri rig. Tri rig brakes. So now I have dual tri rig tri rig brakes on it, and they work so so well. Awesome. And they're very aero. Yep. Um, they've been tested many times by other people in their aero. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have a wheel setup, so really windy conditions. I didn't have any shallow wheels that were um, rim brake that weren't like, you know. I had to, but I would have to do rim tape and everything to all set it up. Yeah, it's also really up and down. So it's if, if you ever want to go to to West Maui, it's it's fantastic riding, probably the best riding I've ever done in my life. Mm-hmm. Smooth roads, but it's just like you know. 20% grade up and we're straight down, mm-hmm. straight up, straight down. Not exactly TT bike stuff. Yeah. And it was raining. So Curvy that too. Yeah, it yeah, was really yeah. fun. Yeah. Nice. Like it really fun. Anyways. Yeah. Um. That's just why I didn't bring my TT bike. Plus I did Haleakala, which is the world's longest paved climb. Yeah. Jonathan did the world's longest this is climb. True. climb. This is true. I climbed yeah. the, ter- the, the terrennial surface of the lo- tallest mountain. Yes. I terrennial can, surface. Yes, I can, I can check that <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. So when you were in Hawaii, um, you didn't bring that TT b- bike and everything else, but you brought your cross bike. Yeah. So I brought my cross bike set up as a road bike. Cool. And I did that. Um, yeah. Wh- why did you do that instead of just bringing your road bike? For gearing, I wasn't sure what how steep Haleakala was, and I saw the steepness that we had at Mauna Kea, and it was just <laughs> insane. Yeah. So I had a 42 up front, and I had an 11, no, a 9.46 E13 cassette in the back. Nice, the TRS. Nine. Yeah, nine. It goes really? down to a nine. It's awesome. Huh. It's uh, it mounts to a SRAM XD driver. So if you have like a SRAM XD driver for a 10.42 or whatever else, you just mount up this one. It's hmm. called the TRS. It can be a bit confusing. That's the TRS race cassette as the 946. That's what you had, right? Yeah, and I thought I had the non-race one. There's the non-race one is called the plus. And strangely enough, that's actually a nine, I think, instead of okay. all the way to a 46. But I think you had 946 on I yours. have 46, yeah. yeah. Anyways, so what that did is by having the one by, I wouldn't have to change anything on my road bike because my road bike has a 1132 and a mid compact on the front. Mm-hmm. So I had more gears mm-hmm. on the back, but actually Haleakala is not that steep. Mm-hmm. There's okay. only a, a couple huh. sections, which we'll get to in a bit that are really steep, but it's not that bad. How long is the climb? 
in terms of duration or oh, it's like it. 35 miles and i think mike woods done, did it in like two hours and 25 minutes so oh. much faster hmm. than uh that's mike woods from ef draft pack education first or whatever the team's name is yeah the cannondale team and number two on that uh people say that's writer hedgedal it's like dean murdoch or something but that's like his <laughs> that's his name yeah. so his he was co- actually training <laughs> yeah i i missed him at a stop people like 10 minutes ago they're like writer hedgedal was here like 10 minutes ago <laughs> It's like, whoa, that that's correct. so cool, right? That yeah. just shows you, though, it's good riding, right? If Ryder Hedgedal yeah, goes over there for sure. to ride. Um, so is this like, uh, is it a rolling, constantly adjusting climb, or is it pretty consistent? Yeah, can we talk about Haleakala? Because I think a lot of yeah, people, there's so many yeah, people who have should. done it. We should totally. Yeah. Um, you start in this town called Paella, and there's a bike shop right there. Mm-hmm. And Donnie, um, he runs the bike shop. I saw him. Mau- Maui's a small place. I saw I saw him twice on the roads, like at the, <laughs> at the same stop. And you can go on these rides and get banana bread and stuff. That's fine. But anyways, Donnie, every Tuesday, if you call up his shop in Paia, he does a supported Haleakala climb huh. for free. Oh, cool. You just show up, whoever's there. Every Tuesday. Uh, yeah, he, he think they change it based on weather. But I called him up. He's like, uh, we did it today. We're going to do it again next Tuesday. No. So we showed up. This He had this guy, Ed, who rode the, the truck. Mm-hmm. He was fantastic i felt like i was on a pro team <laughs> he would every corner everything he was right there he'd come out with the bottles he once like yelled something to me i was like i can't hear you he goes keep going and he gets in his car drives up ahead of me to say it again <laughs> like like he doesn't want to cool. slow me down right that's cool i'm like do you have any uh salt because like really early i felt a little bit like i was cramping yeah. and he's like he like do you want in your bottle or pills and he gave me a whole bottle of endurolites <laughs> and like it was awesome though that's cool. and he was cheering me on so that for free is amazing. Yeah. Pretty awesome. The climb itself is it's 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 mild. It's like five percent average. Oh, okay. There's a couple. Cool. There's one spot that's like twenty percent uh, grade probably for, but only for maybe a quarter mile. Very very sh- maybe less than that. How much of it on. is sheltered by trees? The beginning is very sheltered, uh-huh. and you're fine. But then up top, um, uh, what Donnie told me, conditions can play a huge effect. Mm-hmm. When I got down from it, he goes, dude, you had the worst conditions. <laughs> and I was like, shoot. I saw a picture that you had from the summit, <laughs> and it looked like a lady's hair was being torn off from the wind. Yeah. It so was crazy. I I try to describe this is the most wind I've ever experienced, but yeah. I looked at my, my data file, and at the very top, it gets, you know, there's no trees, right? Mm-hmm. And this is, um, we'll get into elevation climbing because it's a different subject, but depending on the wind is, you, there's these switchbacks, Mm-hmm. But in one direction, you get a push. In another direction, there's a one in your face. But the end, there's a really long drag. Mm-hmm. And I was right into the wind. And I was doing um, – it goes kind of flat at the end, and then it pitches up. So mm-hmm. the flat part, it was like a 1% to 2% grade. I was doing 350 watts for wow. – f- 5.4 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's that sad. So you just think about that. Like you could run faster than that, right? 350 watts. Yeah. That should get me like 30 miles per hour yeah. on the flats, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I actually had to walk the last section of it. And uh, the bike picked picked up in the wind. Just was like flapping like yeah, a like, towel. <laughs> like it went horizontal. It's going to sweep oh, it away if yeah. you let yep. it go. Exactly. Yep. Oh my God. Um, and the last section, I think I lost... I don't know. I was doing pretty well in the climb. And then in, at the very end, it was getting ranked in like the 200s in the Strava segments. And I was like 3,000s, like 2,000s. Just plummeted. Wow. Yeah, because of the, I think. And at the end too, Donnie goes, yeah, the winds just shifted. You would have had a tailwind if you did it like an hour later. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> darn it. So I got a 341. I think I was somewhere in the 200s overall. Nice job. Yeah. Nice I kind of wanted to, I want to go back and do another attempt you have with to go back conditions. to maui and probably exactly. acclimatize for a couple weeks i have and, you to know, yeah. <laughs> but that brings up another point is uh long climbs yeah, yeah. with elevation change big elevation change right because we've got one of those coming up obviously we're gonna stay well high. Hopefully, we got two of them actually. We, hopefully, Chad and I have something like this coming up. You do. You're guaranteed. Fingers crossed. Leadville is is something that we're doing after the 40 KTT challenge. You're doing Leadville, and and that's extreme elevation because you're not just climbing up to that. You're averaging. I think it averages 10,000. We start at 10,000. We start so. at 10,000, go up to 13. Yeah. yeah, and it crosses over 12. I think a Yeesh. couple times or something. So it it averages, I believe, 10,000. I could or I could be wrong on that. So so or people probably all know but the higher in elevation you go the less aerobic power you have mm-hmm. right it, it's you have less fuel less oxygen mm-hmm. to do you probably say it better than i can chat but did i say it right 
Yeah, yeah. Basically, your your blood it changes the affinity that hemoglobin have has for oxygen. So so the hemoglobin doesn't want to let the oxygen go. So you just can't get as much fuel to the the working muscle as you can at lower elevations. Interesting. And a lot of this has to do with the the, the density of the air and the region in which you're in, mm-hmm. uh, and the way your body reacts to that. Yeah, there's still a, a good amount of like I hear a lot of people say there's just no oxygen up there, and effectively perhaps there's yes, plenty. But there's just the same amount of oxygen, just less pressure, and then that has different effects, like you said. So, so on this climb, it starts at zero feet, goes to 10,000. <laughs> I, it was like three hours and 40 minutes for me or 41 minutes. Mm-hmm. And my normalized power was 285. Mm. So I was trying to figure out the fastest way up for power output on this climb. Mm. Should I, and we've already talked about this, but I'm going to say what I had in my brain. Should I try to average 285 the whole time? Mm. Or should I start out at like 310, then maybe go to 300? And then maybe at the end, drop down to 280. And there it is, yeah. That's what it is, right? Yeah, absolutely. And why is that? Because there's no way you're going to maintain 285 when you get up to 13,000 feet. Because I mean, you'd gets, be lucky to do it at 10,000 feet, frankly. Yeah. It gets harder, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we've talked about this before, but there's a chart. And what's the guy's name again? There's a couple. And, and, I, and I dug into these just to you know, kind of help us understand what we were looking at. But they associate declines in, and I'm guessing that's threshold power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is aerobic power. Aerobic yeah. power. Okay. Whatever. Um, where, wherever they set that, um, one of them's by Bassett and the other is by Perrinet. And one looked at world hour records for about a 30 year span. And the other looked at uh, world, uh, different world level running records. Mm-hmm. And then the interest. So the, the, and once again, the concept is the fact that, that your capabilities or your aerobic power will, will decrease, right. Mm -hmm. And, and depending on what elevation you're at and something that I thought before I looked at the data from this, something that I thought is that, um, because there's, there's the side of, if you just assume that you're not acclimatized and you just jump into something like this, Mm -hmm. um, there's an interesting concept here. I thought that it would just basically be like, if you're not acclimatized, it's worse, like across the board and probably consistently worse. Right. But there's somewhat of an of a bell curve it's to like a bell shape, yeah. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. the sense that, like, if you're at you know sea level, it doesn't really matter if you're acclimatized. <laughs> you know, you're going to perform around the same. If you're at fourteen thousand feet, there's you know just about a one percent difference between being acclimatized, acclimatized and non-acclimatized. And not. Yeah. But then the interesting thing is you get around that. I guess uh, probably people wouldn't call this a sweet spot, but you get around a spot of around seven thousand feet, somewhere mm-hmm. around there. And the difference is much bigger. So in the center there, in the meet, where we actually see a lot of like high elevation races, yeah. that's like the high points. That's where that's you're where seeing- That's where it's most beneficial to get there and you know, spend time acclimatizing. Yeah. Almost as much as 6% being the it, difference. It gets pretty substantial, yeah. 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 So what I did is I put the, what's the, not Bassett, but what's the other guy's name? Perinay. Perinay's, um, his like how much percentage drop you would get at each elevation into a spreadsheet. Mm-hmm because it's awesome. <laughs> so I said, let's say I could hold 300 watts if it was all at sea level for that amount of time. And then I would say for every 1,000 feet, there was a percentage drop, right? Mm-hmm. So at 10,000 feet, they say, if I could hold 300, like for that duration at sea level at 10,000 feet, with the, the less air, it'd be only 258 watts. Mm-hmm. That's a significant drop, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you're chasing power numbers all the way up climbs like this, as the altitude or the elevation changes, you you simply cannot do as much work. So in order yeah. to keep those same watch, you're going to have to work harder and harder and harder, and you're just going to bury yourself. Oh, so it's, so an, it's not a viable strategy. 300 would be out of the question. The other approach someone could say is, well, I think overall I would average 280, but then when you get to that 10,000 feet and you're you're really like 300 feels like, or 258 feels like 300, and yeah. you're trying to hold 280, you're going to pop, yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. it's, it's so impossible. Like you're, impossible. It's an interesting concept, right? Because you think, well, I'm going to average this. And at sea level, I could do way more than 280, but I'll just ride at 280. But even then, if you do that, chances are you'll still blow up yeah. um, later on. Just look at know? the average start high and expect to finish low. Yeah, yeah. and which is like so different than time trials, right? No, Because this oh, yeah. is a long time trial, and most people don't go out too hard. Yeah. But I think, so I actually, and if you look at my data, my second, if I break it up into three segments, my middle segment was was stronger. And I actually, I think I went out too easy at the beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And at the end, by the way, after that 350 I did yeah. at the 1%, it kicked up to 24% oh, after that. So I saw that. That's why <laughs> I was like, I can't, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to fall work. over. So uh, the, the inter- I, I did this too on Mount Akea. I don't know, uh, Chad, when you started on a Mount Akea, I started too easy looking back at it hmm. because once I got up to the high elevations, I felt like I was governed. Like I had like a governor on me, like a limit. It wasn't necessarily that I was like insanely out of breath or my legs felt like they were going to blow up. I just couldn't 
work. You know, it was just capped like that. And I, looking back at that, who knows, this could have affected me adversely, but I really feel like I could have, it wouldn't have been pushing it too hard because I was going really easy in the beginning. I should have given it a little more. This pacing stuff's tricky with so elevation. Use the oxygen while you have it, but yes. don't go too deep while yeah. you have it too because you're going to pay for it You can it still blow your pacing for exactly. sure. Exactly. Yeah. It's a balance though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but what's interesting is the strain remains steady all the way up, but mm-hmm. the output, you know, the work that's getting done just drops, drops, drops. So that's, that's a fact you have to accept. You can't chase a particular power output and, and just, just hope it bears out. Yeah. Like we were saying yesterday. Unless of course you take into account what Nate's talking about, that this decline in, you know, aerobic power as the oxygen becomes you know, less dense. Yeah. We were saying yesterday, if you have, a, this is why a power meter can be super helpful, yeah. but with a power meter and no plan like this in terms of like yeah. how it's going to be, then you're probably going to get yourself into trouble. If you just try to stick and a number. Thusly, if you have a plan without a power meter, the same problem, it's going to be really tough to actually stick to that plan because perception yeah also goes a little wonky when you're going up like this, you know, it's hard to really tell where you're at. So a plan like this and a power meter is, is definitely the way to do it. So at Leadville, that brings us to Leadville, right? Mm -hmm. And that starts at 10,000 and Jonathan, I I'm, if I did sub nine, I'd be really, really happy. Yeah. Chad's We'll see what happens in the chat. <laughs> he might be driving yeah. us around. <laughs> we'll see. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to try to qualify, but even if I qualify, uh, we'll see. We yeah. tried to figure out, and this is another thing I don't know, and I don't want to go out and test, mm-hmm. is <clears throat> how long can I hold my FTP for nine hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go test or that. How, how long how can you hold? Oh, not my percentage FTP, right? of FTP. Yeah. Exactly. Hours, yeah. And we estimated, if we're good, maybe 0. 0.65. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we just kind of. Mm-hmm. And that would be, I for me, it. that would be 220 watts. Mm-hmm. But then if you put it into this chart at elevation, at 10,000 feet, that's just 10,000, not even going up. That would put me at 189 watts mm-hmm. for nine hours. Mm-hmm. And then at Leadville has crazy climbs, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So even with Eagle and stuff, I'm going to, it's it's going to be so hard. Yeah. So, it's so hard. Like, gonna be a very... cause it's going to be, you can't maintain that low pace. You're going to have to go deeper than that, and but there's not any air. Yes. Uh, it, and here's the complex thing. This one isn't a time trial. And in one effect it is, but it's a mass start race on very congested Jeep trail, most of it. So you've got situations where, you know, if you don't get a good corral, first of all, which the way that they handle starting there is that based off of your qualifying time or past participation in Leadville, you're then seated into these different, they call them corrals, which are different start groups. And if you get a bad corral position, and you're stuck behind that, uh, you can look it up on YouTube. You can see where it's just, you're walking a six mile climb because there's so many people and they're all stuck. So it, we have to get a good qualifying position. That's why you're still doing Tahoe trail 100 It's because you want to get a fast time. So then you can get a good corral. And the, the crazy thing is you look at this, Nate, if you had to do eight hours, right? So sub eight hours. It's not going to happen. Let's just say, because I have that data in front of me. I don't have your nine, I don't have your nine hour data, <laughs> but you'd have to do 225 watts. And you said 190 at yeah, elevation? Yeah, 189. 189. That's not, con- that's not considering the, that's only if it's at 10,000. And it goes up higher than yeah. that. So it's, yeah, it's really tricky. And then, you know, at a, it's a long day. So you're going to have, you're going to stop a few times unless you're, you know, Todd Wells and, and, and those folks and, and, and Howie, they, they don't, but you know, it's going to be a pretty brutal day. I have to do 191 Watts. It says best bike split to do that in about eight hours. It's going to be hard. It elevation. seems easy. Like where we live, be like, totally. I could do 180 Watts for totally. that long. Like, mm-hmm. but with the elevation and just experiencing 10,000 feet for just a couple minutes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be tricky. So it's, this is something that I feel like, uh, if you have high elevation races or variable elevation races where you're going to be going up high and you have like that critical climb that goes really high, you should know roughly how that affects your, your pacing, or you should know how it affects your pacing strategy. If you're going to be using yeah. power, especially. Can you imagine if we showed up at Leadville and we didn't know about this <laughs> and we think we could held 220? Yeah. You probably could it. for four it hours. It'd be a short day. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, well, or a really Just long day. Cause yeah. you go four yeah. hours out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And then so coming back. Eight just... hour walk back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other part about Leadville is that there's also a lot of there's these huge climbs, but there's also a lot of flat section and road section. Yep. Mm-hmm. And if you can get in a good group with drafting, yes. even though the air is super thin because there is none, <laughs> yeah. um, that also 
uh, I've heard can take a lot of time off. A huge amount. And think of the energy it can save you. I mean, that's the big thing. I think that when you're looking at that, it's rather than looking at the time saved in the drafting section, you should be looking at the energy saved there. So then you can better pace yourself or maintain throughout. So this is another, okay. We're going farther into this than I thought, but I have have things in my mind or than we planned. Yeah. Um, so there's a beginning climb, right? And mm-hmm. I think, Jonathan, and if we are up, if we get a good crowd position, we should actually go pretty hard on that because I just think of like the group rides that I do here where I'm just sitting in the pack and it's so slow. I mean, it feels I mean, so easy, mm-hmm. but then later on you look on Strava and you're like, well, that was the fastest time I've ever done, Yep. Mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. just so much, if you can get a pack of 20 people on the road, yep. it is. it saves so much time and energy and that might benefit Yes. But who knows if we're going to see a pack. And the important thing is finding a pack that that meshes with your speed, your ability, everything yeah. else. Because if yeah. you find yourself in a spot where the pack is moving really fast and you cook yourself just to hold on to them, not going to do you many How many favors. people do, Lead Bill? Uh, I want to say that it's... A few thousand? Uh, yeah, it's, it's in the thousands, I Oof. believe. Yeah. yeah, that's... It's definitely in your best interest to get out ahead of that. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think we just... I think the strategy is... First climb, not go, not kill ourselves, but mm-hmm. go, st- quote, strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then try to get into a, a kind of pack and then. Yeah. And Sounds it's reasonable. Coming back, man, the, the climbs are punishing coming back. They're steep. You know, power line's extremely steep coming back. It's really tough. So it's, and then Columbine's just extremely long. Um, that's going to be a, a really long one. So How long? How long? Uh, oh, I don't even know. I want to say that that's somewhere around nine miles. I could be wrong. Though. Mm. Somebody that's like a Leadville guy that's done it 20 so times. So an, an hour plus for li- sure. Is in his mind. Yeah. Chad, if you don't qualify, you're just going to be laughing at us. <laughs> <laughs> Crying maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I think we're going to show up to Tahoe Trail 100, which is a qualifying event. And Chad's going to be like, oh, my, my, I got a flat tire. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. nah, I, I still plan to try to qualify. Whether or not I go to Leadville is yeah. still up in the air, very much up in the well, air. Well, you're going to come. I'll be there. We've got your plane ticket. Yeah, yeah. I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's. I'm excited for that. That's going to be something super interesting. Um, we we're kind of we've been been geeking out plenty as we always do, but we've been geeking out plenty on power, whether it's for Haleaka and Leadville and that sort of stuff. But all of us are doing the 40 KTT challenge right now. What's that? So Just kidding. yeah, <laughs> we're all. <laughs> but I I will explain it because some folks yeah, I'm sure new listeners know all the time. So. Uh, the state time trial championships are now, I believe, at the end of June, right? Yep, yep. Uh, they moved. So it's we've got an extra month. Uh, so it's at the end of June, and it's going to be the Nevada state championships, but anybody can come race it. And the reason that you would want to come race this is because it's a very, very good 40 KTT course. It's at about 5,000 feet in elevation, so darn near ideal. Mm-hmm. The course is, is as far as 40 KTT courses go, very flat. Why is 5,000 feet I- is ideal? Yeah, so you get to this trade-off point, and and Chad, I'm sure you can add in more information, but as you go up higher in elevation, there's less air density, which means you can move through the air quicker. Uh, But at the same time, there's also the trade-off that you have to think of as you move up, there's less readily available oxygen, Mm -hmm. and you have those, those effects on you. So they say, and I've heard this, but I don't have any, I don't know the data behind it, but I've heard that 5,000 is around the ideal tipping point Mm -hmm. for where you have a a decent enough amount of oxygen, but then thinner air. Yeah. You take the same rider at sea level out of 40 KTT and the same rider at 5,000 feet and they'll go faster 5,000 feet, even though there's less air. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. Yep. Yeah. I have nothing more to add. Great explanation. So the course is really flat too, which means that if you have like a 40 K, if you have a goal to like set a really fast 40 KTT time, this would be it because mm-hmm. it's it's a really good course for it. I think there's only one faster course that I've heard of in the country. New Mexico, I think. Is I've that? Heard, yeah, right. it's like New Mexico. Yeah, I believe so. It's there's oh, in there's the one in New Mexico. I was going to say Sally. Oh yeah, I thought that's, Sally that's, was the fastest, fastest and I think it but is. it got closed down that's by locals. Yeah, there's one and there's yeah. one in New Mexico. Because one day a year was too much of a burden for them to bear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's one in New Mexico, and it's half like, the day too. Yeah. I think it's pan flat, like even flatter beautiful surface and that one is is usually i guess it's in a spot where where they say that usually like the winds aren't as bad everything else it's it's apparently from what i've read it's the fastest course but okay. who knows um this one's very hey, fast we're going to be there too it's true story so um, <laughs> you want to witness this in person <laughs> yes all three of us are training for this and our goal in this is to find out everything we can about how to become a faster time trialist, then relay this information to all of you. We're doing that with a documentary that we're filming as we go along with this. And of course, we're sharing the information here um, and we'll be sharing it on, on Trainer Road's blog and everything else coming up uh, as well. So uh, anyways, with that said, we've got our bikes, you've got a Cervelo P5, 
Yep. Uh, Chad's got the giant Trinity advanced. And then I have a Trek speed concept, all very fast super bikes, uh, where we did some setup stuff. We, as far as getting bike fits, and then we've also done aero testing, which it's, it's kind of funny how those two seem to be at odds with each other many times, you know, most powerful position versus aerodynamically yep. efficient, yep. which I have a whole spreadsheet about what we can get into. Yep. And we're just now getting to the point where we're really figuring out our capabilities in our new positions. Yep. Uh, you just did a ramp test. Yep. So if you know what the ramp test is, uh, join the trainer or beta group. Basically it's, um, going to be our new way to estimate FTP. Yep. And I did the ramp test. So I wanted to know the difference between the power output on my road bike and my TT bike. Mm -hmm. And so effectively a, a road FTP and a time trial FTP. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to see what the difference is. Yeah. Just I'd, to call it. Yeah. yeah. In an ideal world, they, they would be the same, right? Well, physiologically, the same things occur, but how much of, how much work you can do in various positions changes your power output or so changes. So I did it and my, my road bike. So I'm going to do the road bike test today. Okay. But last time I did it, I think I scored 338. I think we had an old formula, so it was 345 at the time. But I had trained a long time with that. I thought 345 was good for me on the road bike. I did 285 for almost four hours. Yeah. So it seems like that number is it right. Bears out. Yeah, yeah. On the TT bike, I did 309, mm -hmm. which is an 11% drop from that. We'll get better data, mm -hmm. and you can see the test on Strava. Follow me at Nate Pearson, <laughs> P-E-A-R-S-O-N. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> so uh, that is 11% drop. And so I've read things, people saying 10% drop, but it was actually like really disheartening, right? Mm -hmm. Like to drop that much mm -hmm. and to see the numbers that I had been training like in October mm -hmm. now, I'm like, oh, all that's gone. Yeah. But now it's time for adaption. And I'm going to try to see how close I can get that. But I'm also going to do... <clears throat> At the end of this thing, I'm going to do, so I'm going to do more, more ramp tests on the TT bike, but at the end, I'm going to do one on the road bike and the TT bike again with this, this one day of rest in between, mm -hmm. uh, to see that if I train on the TT bike exclusively for these three months, and that's your mm -hmm. plan. Yep. Mm -hmm. What happens on my TT power? And then does my road power change or does my road power stay the same or does my road power go down? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think they will both go up, but, uh, who knows, right? Yeah. So that'll this will be a nice n equals one sure. study. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. it's fun, yeah. right? Yeah, and we're, it's, so all we're trying to do is we know that Nate is capable of uh, an FTP around three forty ish, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then he gets Maybe. on his TT bike and it's more like three ten. Yeah. So it's a substantial decrease, and we're trying to narrow that gap. Yeah. We and know what his body can do, but we put it in this crunch position, and it can't do that same amount of work. So we want to find out: Are there ways that we can tweak the bike? Are there ways we can tweak his training? Can he get used to this position just simply by spending more time in it, and make that gap narrower and narrower? And then he's added on to it the 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 possibility of, you know, will they rise at this or will they change at the same rate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, and it's an interesting point because I've been doing, um, my, my training recently on the TT bike and, uh, and I haven't seen like, I haven't felt like I've seen any improvement or anything else. I'm just still in that position, slugging away at it. I have almost a, I have almost a 14% drop almost, uh, at least calculated between much. those two. But mm -hmm. you're going to do uh, it's quite a, lot. a test. So yep. there, there, that brings up a point that I want to talk about for me, I'm actually, so when we went to Aero, we did the the went to the velodrome and did the uh, aerodynamic testing, mm -hmm. and I have the data in front of me. But I'm kind of where my baseline was, which was I'm higher. Mm -hmm. My baseline drag was like 0.258, mm -hmm. which is good for someone who's as tall as me. Um, and then w with the drop, I lost a lot of power, and I don't have that um, that data. But what I'm saying is that 309 is my quote power position, mm -hmm. which. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if I could mm -hmm. go down and save looking at this 10 watts for a big drop, but I, the feeling, I haven't tested this, but the feeling I had was, oh my gosh, that was a gigantic, drop. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. maybe I'd have a 250 FTP. Yeah. yeah. So, so you I'm, save 10, 10 watts in aerodynamics, but cost yourself 40 yeah. watts in actual power delivery. So you're at a loss. And, and with yeah. Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan's yeah. got a world-class CDA. He is <laughs> like, is. he's serious. He's as, is, as slippery <clears throat> as Tour de France elite time trialist, yep. even more than some of the world champs. Mm -hmm. Um, we think because your, your drop is it's, it's weird. Cause he's, he's got a drop of what you say, 14% and you're going to do a ramp test to just really mm -hmm. try to figure out the exact numbers. Yep. There could be a few things. One, he's just brand new to this. Mm -hmm. So it could I, just, cause I am, you are right. Mm -hmm. Two, you could be, maybe we could give up some of that, that maybe drag. I'm too low. Yep. 
like you don't feel too mm-hmm. low. Nothing right. hurts on you. Mm-hmm. It feels fine. But maybe we could try to push you up a little more. But that's with your bike. It's actually hard to do that. So <laughs> yeah, for such an adjustable bike, they make it very difficult to actually adjust it. Yeah. Yeah. If you change stack height, that's where problems arise. With the Trek speed concept. Oh. You have to get different stems or different spacers and. Uh, in my case, if I get the different stem, it throws a lot of the geometry, the front end out of whack because mm. it changes the length of things and it gets a little complicated. So just changing a spacer is ideal, but I actually have to reroute all the cables. You have to tear the bike, the bike apart. It's so kind of a mess. What I'd like you to do, Jonathan, is test like in your, in your position on mm-hmm. the ramp test and then kind of go up maybe two or three centimeters, mm-hmm. test that. Mm-hmm. And then we could... We're not going to really know how much slower you are in drag, yeah. but if you gain back like 25 watts, I'd highly doubt you are saving or losing 25 watts in aero drag. Yeah, yeah, right? so, like, yeah exactly. Like it's There's a lot of things where, you know, Chad, you have a lot of experience time trialing, so you kind of know roughly, you know, where you should or how you should feel in certain positions in terms of your power output and your comfort and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And for me, it's so new. There, there are plenty of things for me to wade through. I have to solve some, some, some variables in the equation before I can actually find out what's causing what. So it's, it's, it's an interesting point. And I, I think first, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do an F I'm, or I'm going to do the ramp test on the road bike. And then I'm going to do a ramp test on the TT bike. Um, and then we'll, we'll see from there and, and then we'll, you know, make adjustments if we need to, to see how far it is or how far off it is. But mm-hmm. this is a question we get all the time. Yeah. Like people always wonder why, or if it's bad that they have a situation where they put out less power with this. And just one thing, and we'll, we'll continue to get into this, but one thing I wanted to say for, for everybody is it's very normal to see this. Mm-hmm. And, and like you said, Chad, it's, it's a totally different experience, even though you're pedaling a bike, mm-hmm. it's a different yeah, experience. Yeah, we'll get to that. We, we're yeah. going to expand it, on that. It's mm-hmm. almost like you're an outlier. There's always someone on a forum that's like, I put out the same wattage or I put out more, more. on my TT bike. You see that. And everyone's well. like, it, you just make everyone feel horrible. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah you, you'd be quiet person. Yeah. And this is, like a, this is like a journey that I think every time trial or triathlete goes through. Yeah. And I even had this when I went from road bike with aero bars to TT bike because I, I put myself in a really aggressive position. Yeah. As you would at Probably first, looked right? really good. <laughs> and I couldn't hold it. And then I, there, there was a time, and then I did a few races on my road bike with aero bars again, because I was like, I'm, I probably was faster on that. Yeah. There's this journey where you try to figure out where the balance is between comfort, power, and aerodynamics. Yep. In that and, order. Yep. And we're kind of lucky to have, or I mean, we're very lucky to have the aerodynamic testing that we did. So we have yes. some data yeah. to better frame this position of comfort and power. Um, I put in some new numbers and and by the way, uh, Chad might disagree with me, but what I'm doing, cause I'm going hundred percent on my TT bike. I put my FTP and trainer road at 309 and I'm doing just that and I'm going to raise it. And then I'm going to retest in three weeks and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I put in our new data. So I'm going to put my FTP right now at 309. Chad's at 300 right now. Yeah. 310, 315. Okay, so Ooh. Chad wins then. Oh, he's stepping up. Well, you're just <laughs> uh, I just just based on the ride yesterday, I know my FTP is higher. Yeah. But on your TT bike or on your road bike? Oh yeah, that can't say on the TT bike. Yeah, I'm just saying. And on I'm going to do the same set of tests, ram tests. So we'll yeah. see. But I, I'm basing on you've been doing workouts at 300 FTP on sure. your TT Leave bike yep. at intensity and finishing them well. So that's why I was going to say 300. Okay. And I put you at 265, Jonathan, because that's your estimate and drop. Yeah, which might be a little much. Uh, I don't think that I could go out and hold 260. Uh, I might be able to hold 265 for an hour. It'd be, it'd be tough. So Same with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody's it's making a conservative estimate here. <laughs> so with those numbers and best bike split, the winner right now would be Jonathan. <laughs> oh. With a 5316. Why, why do you say, oh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just didn't, I didn't expect that. I you would beat me shocked. by... 31 seconds. Okay. And then I would then beat Chad by 44 seconds if he's at 300. But basically what I put in the sheet is that Chad and I have the exact same aerodynamics because mm. based on the results mm. and the little tweaks we've made since then for comfort, we probably do. We have we are just as aero and one thing that's going to matter, especially if we come with the same FTP, mm-hmm. is how how much we can hold and turtle mm-hmm. and keep our head down mm-hmm. because in the velodrome we could do that for like a couple, maybe like one lap. I did it right. I couldn't even do it. I can only do it on the straights. As soon as the curves hit, it was it yeah. was too disorienting. The vertigo yeah. was, it was scary. It's tricky. Yeah, it's really yeah. tricky. Mm-hmm. But on the road, it's a lot easier. Uh-huh. And with that, we know that can save you like ten lots right there. Quite a lot. So if I could do that for twenty percent of the time, but you could do it for fifty percent, 
I you win. I do it for 100%. So. 100%. Oh, threw down the gauntlet right there. You sure did. Let's say 95%. <laughs> Just so I can peek over the road every once in a while. <laughs> not, anyway. Not hit a deer. <laughs> So that's, that's, pro- that's I, good. I don't know. Um, so that, and, and of course that's an ideal, but it's important to look at this sort of stuff and, and tools like Best Bike Split can be really helpful with that. Um, so they should give us money because we talk, about, we talk them about them all, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a nerdy tool for us nerdy folk, right? Yeah. Make a nerdy tool and we'll talk about it. That's it. Um, and, and actually speaking of that, you know, we've done this different aero testing that we've done at the, at the velodrome and, and other things with aero sports. And we're, we're testing out different things right now, like field tests, like options that you could do, uh, instead of having to go and pay for, for, for a wind tunnel or something like that, something that you could do at home and then just use a, a tool we're, online. We're trying anyway. Yeah. And we're, we're, gonna, we're testing. We're, yeah, yeah. We're testing yeah, them testing. and we'll figure yeah. out if these things, uh, which works best or what the best protocol is. And hopefully we'll have some info on that. Just something at a, at a high level. Mm-hmm. Well, all of these, these field tests need zero wind or constant wind. Yeah, and in Reno, so it's really hard to get that. I don't know if that's <laughs> easy anywhere. Yeah. You know, it's I mean, pretty No, tough. there's places in the, in the Midwest and stuff where yeah. you wake up and there's no wind for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we have the mountains and the temperature change and yeah. 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 Once we get to summer, it usually stabilizes a little more, um, but you know, we'll see. We'll keep you updated. Yes. I don't want to say just because we can't get it to work though. It's a bad test. Exactly. It's, right. it's really where sure. you pick in the course and there's could be a place with trees or stuff like that. Yeah. Someone had, I think Chad had a good idea. We, if we could find a, a big like warehouse tesla, tesla? Yeah. yeah the tesla gigafactory we'll tesla to invite us in. yeah i think it's like over a kilometer long the building so that's perfect that's yeah. all it's like our own velodrome yeah exactly that'd be cool i'm sure elon musk would be up for that um let's get into kevin's question because it actually has to do with what we're talking very about much Is that what cool? we're talking about. it's like you planned it it's like we did right uh, so he says, I've been really enjoying using Trainer Road to prepare for my first Olympic triathlon in May. Uh, for those that don't know what an Olympic triathlon is, it doesn't mean that Kevin's going to the Olympics, just so that people know. Olympic um, distance. <laughs> yeah, Olympic distance. How long is the swim? 1.5K swim, yep. 40K TT, uh, and 10K run. 10K run. Thank yeah. you, Chad. You betcha. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he designed. It's like he designed our triathlon plans or something. Like I right? studied up on the map. Yeah, he's, uh, he says I, I did a couple of base training segments using my old felt road bike with a Power Two Max crank based power meter, and he says a dumb trainer. Really, what that just means he does. He isn't insulting his trainer. He just means that it isn't a smart trainer. Not uh, electronic. Before I found a really good deal on a used BMC TM01. That's a TT bike that I put a stages left side only power meter on. So he's changed his bike from uh, just the the normal road bike to a time trial bike, and he's changed his power meter over as well. And even though power meters should read very close to the same, we we have noticed that there is some variance in power meters. So uh, he says, I've had a really awesome guru-based bike fit done on the TM01, and it's super comfortable for me to be in, but I can't help but notice that I struggle to hold power based on my old FTP that I had on my road bike. Hey. Welcome hey to Kevin. Welcome to the welcome club. To the club. <laughs> It says VO2 max, VO2 max workouts were particularly striking as they went from being one of my strengths to being the most painful workouts imaginable. Sit up. Finally, this morning I had to use my road bike again while I wait for a replacement chain for the TT bike, and it just felt so much easier. With all that in mind, my question is this. Do you think that this major difference in RPE, which is rate of perceived exertion. Uh, is How like, hard it feels. Mm-hmm, I'm seeing, do you think that this is uh, due to differences in the power meters? differences in my ability to maintain power in the aero position or both. He says, and then I'm just going to read through this really quick, some information. He says, I recently ram tested at 176 on the TT bike, which was somewhat disappointing after a base period of training at 180. I haven't performed a recent ram test on the road bike. Um, he says, holding wattage on the road bike feels so much easier that I'd estimate my FTP to be at at least 20 watts higher compared to how much I was suffering on the TT bike. Love to hear your thoughts. That's almost exactly a 10%. It's roughly 10%. Too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one thing I want to say about power meters before we jump into this mm-hmm. is, uh, if I, I think generally as a company, I'm just going to say it because I'll, okay. I'll, I'll have this message for us. Yeah. If you do switch power meters, I do say retest. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I think it's unless you know that the power meters are close and the way you can know is let's say you have you have Garmin vectors and a cork, you ride them at the same time because you get them at the same time, yeah. or you have a smart trainer and you can say, you know, smart trainers, um, you know, spin down calibration and you ride one bike on it and you can see like, oh yeah, these are matching up. Then you put the other bike on it and they match up. So you, there's something to compare. Yeah. yeah. It's not that the smart trainer is correct. It's just a constant. In the exactly. Test. And if they're both like 10 Watts over, I would say, cool, these two power <clears throat> meters are 10 Watts over. And I would try it like, you know, hundred Watts, 200 Watts, 300 Watts. Mm-hmm. Um, so. And, and, and I've done that with mine. I've, my SRM stages and cork match up. 
Yeah, I've noticed that too. Yeah, they're all very close. Yeah. But I would. But if you do change, especially if you're going from like one power meter to the other power meter, not switching again, mm -hmm. just do another test. Yeah, and there are times when you could get a power meter and maybe then, you know it isn't calibrated properly from the factory or something like that too. So, um, you know, uh, things mistakes. Well, they're happen. plus or minus one point five percent. Really close. Well, I mean, you, you think that's close, but that's still, it's it's a good amount at, when you're in the higher wattages. So 300 to 400 watts. And yeah, so you can, I would still say redo it because even mm -hmm. five watts difference between two power meters is enough to at threshold to kind of like, yeah. you're doing over unders and it starts to be over overs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's really yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah, at overs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, I mean, I, I guess let's get deeper into on, in terms of like the demands on the body when you're in that TT position, mm -hmm. perhaps compared yeah. to... A standard position. Yeah. So first and foremost, just understand that it's it's probably more stressful. There aren't too many people who slip into a time trial position or a more arrow position and feel better doing so. Yeah. You know, yeah. sitting taller, keeping a wider hip angle, just just being able to breathe more easily. It's it's just less stressful on the body. Yeah. So understand that it will be a little tougher, and that's more work for the body to deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're trying to devote all your resources to output, to powering the bike down the road, and now you have to cut in a little bit of those resources to accommodate this new position. Yeah, your power is going to suffer. That's and part of it. Can I just add one thing onto that too? It, like in my mind, before I had ridden in the arrow position, and I'm sure there are plenty of people thinking about this, I thought, okay, so when you're in that position, and Chad, when you talk about you know it being costly to your body to hold that position, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that you're white knuckled or that like you're carrying a ton of strain yeah. in your shoulders. Yeah, it's just a. It's just in that position, your body's doing more work just to hold yourself. Yeah, exactly. In that when position. you sit on a road bike, I mean, if your bike's properly fit, and Pete talked about this a couple weeks back, he's, when he gets on his bike, it's like ah, it's like everything's properly supported and just as it should be. Mm -hmm. You get on a time trial bike, you know, maybe, maybe some people have adapted their or tweaked their fit to the point where they get that as well on the TT bike, but those people are few and far between. <laughs> so you're taking a position that's very comfortable and familiar and going to a position that's a little uncomfortable and unfamiliar. I, I say the, the initial part of that is very few and far between where people initially get on the TT bike, but I'm, I've known a lot of riders who then ride their bike all the time. The TT bike all yep. the time. I, um, Dave Christian just said he used to go on 100 mile rides with Justin Rossi. Yeah. And he'd be on his TT bike and he'd be comfortable. And if you look at the chase on YouTube for Trader Road, yeah. he is arrow, right? That does not look comfortable at all. And yep. he could hold that for 100 miles. Yeah. Like amazing, right? And I don't, I don't think that is. we should ask Rossi, but I don't think he just like got on the TT bike and could do that right away. Oh, I you doubt know what I mean? It. You have it's to adaption work into those and things. Exactly. That would surprise the heck out of me. And something that's, that's, um, Something that I would add to this is that I, I took the actually the approach you're doing, Nate. I initially said 100% road or TT bike. I want to get used to that position. I'm just going to throw myself into the deep end, so to speak, and I'll figure out how to swim later. Yeah. And I, you know, now looking at that, I've figured out that holding the position isn't going to be a challenge for me. Um, and, and I really find a lot of wisdom in actually the workout text, believe it or not, Chad, that you've been talking to me through this whole time and that, that I work into the position. This is like, uh, and what I'm getting at with it, with this is that it is, it's a process and it's normal to see this gap and, and, and you may see that gap drop down. It'll be different at different rates for different people. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's different. And we're still, the, the focus should always be on pr improving performance. And, and typically that's going to come by growing your, your power. Mm -hmm. It's not going to come by adapting to your position. So just keep on building that engine. The engine gets bigger and bigger. Even if you, when you get into that position, you lose a little bit of your power while well, you're losing a little bit of a higher power. Mm -hmm. So still the, the conditioning should almost always be at the forefront of everybody's attention. There, there, are, there are some people who have, have elevated their fitness to a point where the only gets they're going to get from this point forward are arrow gains. So sure, they pursue those and they pursue them hard, mm -hmm. but most of us don't fall into that group of folks. There's also this, the like being able to hold the position. That's mm -hmm. also conditioning that you need to be able to do. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of, I mean, it, I, I feel like I do a decent amount of, of training for, for my whole body and then riding mountain biking, mm -hmm. I th riding mountain bikes. I think that you build a lot of core strength and, and more upper body strength. Perhaps I see some cyclists that look like a reverse, like, or like a centaur, you know, like, mm -hmm. like massive legs and just nothing upstairs <laughs> at all. And if you're in that position where you with have a little that, hat with a little brim, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's how I think of a cyclist. <laughs> right. And if you're in that position and I'm not saying that, that just because you look one way or another, that you aren't, you aren't capable. But what I'm getting at is it, especially if you're the traditional cyclist that has just neglected any type of core strength, upper body, anything like that, then you're really going to probably find that TT position really hard to hold. Um, yeah. that brings me to something else I want to talk about. I've been doing weightlifting for 
the TT position. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to just describe real quick a couple exercises. Cool. And Chad, I haven't ran these past you. You tell me if they're done or not. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> this, and this is, live, is just people. <laughs> this is live. So this is based on where I'm kind of sore and tired yeah. after the TT. Yeah. Um, the first, and I do other stuff, but these are just the ones I want to hit every time. One is uh, lateral raises. So sure. raising your, I keep my elbows bent, raise them side to side. That yeah. gets the sides of my shoulders. Lateral deltoids. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that really gets tired. Another one is wide grip T-bar row. That gets my upper rhomboids. Mm-hmm. And like that's kind of the middle traps. of your back. Yeah, your, your lower traps kind of. Mm-hmm. Traps, that's yeah. a very bro muscle right Mid there. Traps, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do shrugs. Mm-hmm. That gets traps too. Yeah. And then the last one I do, we have this, I bought this thing online. It's this thing that goes <laughs> over your head and a chain hangs from your head and you hang a weight and you pretty much just lift your neck up and down. Yeah. And <laughs> so sorry that everybody can't see that. No. All the people listening. <laughs> you can look on live. It'll be live again. Um, I, I'm going to put it in the TT video, but it, that works like, I don't know what the two muscles are called, but the long muscles on the back of your neck that get so tired. Yeah, oh yeah. That really works those well. Yeah, your cervical erectors, I, whatever. I don't know. Those I sensors. think that. I got to do it a lot more, right? Because weightlifting can't just do it a couple times. Yeah, so you're spot treating the things that irritate you or yeah. aggravate you on the bike. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Fold it into your training and it doesn't hamper the, the bike end of things, but it does allow you to hold that position better and devote less of your attention to the discomfort that arises when you, we sit in this TT position. I'm all for it. There's so Even yesterday, I did a two-hour ride aerobic on the trainer. And I just had a little like pain in my shoulder and then little like tender bits pain. Yeah. And, and just understand it's not just strengthening. There's also flexibility issues in there too. Yeah. So totally. Yeah. You're right. But just the, having a little bit of discomfort makes it so much harder to hold power. And this goes back it to is. what Pete oh, said absolutely too. absolutely does. And then we're, it's like a 20 or 30 watt. It's in here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so this, this is, this dovetails into this very nicely when, when you load the muscles in a different manner than they're used to. And, and let's not focus on all this stuff in, in, in the, the, the position related stress that Nate's talking about, but even the muscles that are driving the bike, you know, your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings, we take them and, and we, we sit in this up upward position with a, a wide hip angle and create power. And then we get down into this low position with a, a vastly reduced hip angle. And we try to create the same power. We're loading the muscles in a different way than we've trained for. Again, why wouldn't you expect to not be great at it right away, to yeah. not require some period of adaptation? Oh, yeah. I, and, and I equate this to, and this is a, it's a pretty stark contrast, but if you think of doing a squat in the gym where you load the bar across your back, I don't care if you carry it high or low, but it's on your back behind your head, you can bang out a bunch of weight. Take that same weight, put it in front of your body. Your position changes minimally, but the loading on your muscles changes substantially, and you have to drop a heck of a lot of weight to maneuver basically the same movement yeah. with a slightly differently loaded weight. It's yeah. called a squat, just like the other one. It's basically it's the same movement. change. Take a look but, at it. But then it feels totally it's different. It's hugely different because we're asking the muscles to move in slightly different ways, but those slight changes are actually magnified. Pretty. That's a good analogy too, because back squats kind of emphasize the hamstring, gl- the glutes, and the, yep. um, the quads, but front squats are mostly the quads. Mm-hmm. And what I feel like in my TT position is quad burn. Mm-hmm. And what I have in my mind, I don't know if this is, I don't have any science to back this up. <laughs> this is what I think of in my brain is when I'm in the TT position, my limiter is like quad strength, kind of like the, the my, 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 my quads just aren't strong enough. My aerobic engine is there. That didn't change. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but you're cooking one set of muscles. Exactly. And then the adaption happens where, um, muscular, your muscles get stronger faster than your aerobic system improves. Okay. That I feel like that's going to get faster or be stronger. And I'm going to get these giant quads <laughs> faster than my aerobic system. Then it will all, I'll be able to use my whole aerobic engine. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I'm thinking in my brain. <laughs> to, to your point, or to, to the point that you were bringing up earlier, though, Chad, how it makes different muscles react in different ways, yeah. it, that, that quad burn you feel could just be because you aren't yet efficient at utilizing the proper muscles across the whole or entire your, deal. your position has shifted you heavy onto your quads. That's what it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which is often mm-hmm. the case. And I even find myself in intervals where my quads start to light up. I start to recognize I'm not really employing the posterior aspect of, of those driving uh, the, the legs, basically, mm-hmm. my hamstrings and my glutes. And I can just in that moment, I mean, split second, alleviate some of the stress on my quads by just being a little more active in mm-hmm. those muscles. Yeah, I try that too, but it's almost like it's too late. So I, I, <laughs> you know I've I mean? got, it might be. It I've, might got be. A, I've got a thing for you to try. Riding rollers is scary for most people. <laughs> I'm not riding rollers. <laughs> but here's but a, for me, it's terrifying. Here's, here's a takeaway I had. So when you get into the aero position, it, it's, it's extremely hard to hold that position. Unless you're putting out like a high amount of wattage, that's when rollers get more stable um, mm. because you're usually carrying more tension through your whole body and you're a little more like, strong through the whole thing. But 
if you just try to ride those rollers for like five minutes in position, you're like, oh my goodness, my glutes and my hamstrings, like everything is working so hard just to keep me stable. Yep. And it's really interesting how doing that versus, you know, riding in, in any other scenario, whether it's on the road or on the trainer or anything else, I feel like it doesn't allow you to put out as much power because you're just trying not to die. <laughs> but what it does is it's amazing how it lights up all those muscle groups, you know, and you realize that, oh, I don't just use my quads in this position because, you know, it may be a bad position, but I'm also just not really using them because maybe I'm not as efficient yet or mm. whatever else it might be. It's going to be different for every person though. Like, uh, like you mentioned that position that you might be in might be loading up your quads more, mm. or you might be in a situation too, where you get into an arrow position. It's not an aggressive position, but you think, oh, my back and my neck hurts. Well, I didn't hear somebody else say their back or neck hurts. So maybe it's a unique problem. The fact is the whole thing is unique to each person. Um, TT bike fits are, are, are really surprisingly unique. I feel like I've had to learn how to ride a bike all over again in terms of, of using my muscles effectively mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. So it's been a really cool process, um, so far. I'm, I'm interested to see how much we can improve it. So a lot, yeah. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> Yeah. Doug's question, uh, somewhat along the same lines. He says, I'm a 50 year old male triathlete. And he says a retired army helicopter test pilot. That sounds like a crazy job. Yeah. And thank you for that, by the way, we appreciate it, Doug. Uh, he says, well, which army? Uh, yeah, that's just true. Kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. We're on teams here, aren't we? He says, and just finished the full Ironman base plan and moved into the half Ironman build plan. Uh, he's prepping for, for Ironman Wisconsin, a half there in June. Says, been longtime user of TR. Love the podcast. They're great to listen to during the Friday Pettit rides. <laughs> five stars for sure. Um, so he says, my question is, let's say I have three to five thousand dollars to spend on getting faster on the bike for up my upcoming triathlon season. He says, I plan on biking and completing as an age grouper in a for a number of years to come. I'm consistently hitting my training rides and other and other workouts in the plans. I have a stages power meter on my Cervelo P3. That's a TT bike for people that don't know, and it's got stock components. And then I've got a Trek Madone road bike. I do a bike fit at the beginning of every season and not really interested in getting a new bike. And he does mention the N plus one deal pulling him to a cross bike, but he says, I'd love to get your thoughts on how to buy more speed. It's shallow. I know he says, but I do want to hear your thoughts. Should I get a new set of wheels? Other than that, should I look at recovery boots like Normatex, nutrition coaching, upgrading components, electronic shifting, newest helmet? I know you guys are focused on the bike, but if you have any thoughts on the run swim, that would be cool too. He says, thanks again for the fantastic product. Hope to see you in Kona someday. So we kind of like, uh, we, we built out a list of different things. And uh, I guess to kind of turn this a bit on its head rather than an upgrade, one of the things that I see, and I, I only say this because we're definitely going to cover the parts upgrades and the component upgrades that you can get, but something to consider with this is if you are in training, full on training mode, and you want to get either more training or you want to just enjoy the process a little bit more, I've personally found like a, a week experience, whether it be a training camp or whether it be just a, a riding, uh, like a group ride thing that you're doing for a week, anything like that. Some type of trip like that can be really beneficial. And it's invigorating for motivation. Totally. It right? can be like, really helpful. It, there's the whole thing we've talked about where you're going to have to then rest afterwards and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but it can really be like, I love this sport. This oh, is, yeah. I want to do this yeah. all the time. Yeah. This is yeah. so much fun. Yeah. Like last year I went to go, this is mountain biking, so a bit different, but I went to Whistler for a week and it wasn't a huge TSS week. It was decent. But what I loved about the thing, it just made me fall in love with riding a mountain bike again. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really helpful for me like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so those can be super helpful. That's what I would say. Chad, what about you? So I often say, uh, I'm more about the software than the hardware, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what's funny about that in, in this day and age is that we are actually a software-based company, <laughs> so it's really about the software. But, but what I mean is address the conditioning, address the body, you know, the soft parts. Um, buying speed is all good and fine, but unless you have all your other ducks in a row, it's just it's icing on a cake that's not not baked yet. You got to... You gotta, you gotta do things in the proper order. And, and to that end, I, I see nutrition counseling as something that would probably be the best money spent because I think too many people, and Nate's perfect evidence of this, he ate one way and his performance kind of stagnated. He starts eating just higher quality food in general without getting into details, just higher quality. And what happens with his performance? I Gets mean, really, other things go really into fast. it, but <laughs> nutrition <laughs> is, a, is a huge aspect. And, and I think a lot of athletes think they understand nutrition, but it's such a big topic. And if you can find you know, the, the right nutrition counselor or the right um, nutritionist, dietitian, whatever, then um, that that's where I'd spend my money. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this earlier too. There's kind of like this, I think we're all on board with this, where you, 
nutrition to to be like a healthy person and fuel your workouts. Yeah, bigger picture. And then the composition will just come. Totally. Right? Like the, the instead of like eating for weight loss, unless the only thing I would say is if you're like obese or something like that and you need to get yeah, that, like you're in an unhealthy things. weight. Yeah. Right. But you're you're like uh, not in the extremes. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, yeah. Doug, you know, he's training regularly, everything yeah. else. I he's doubt he's, he's in probably that not, yeah. Army mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and it also obviously behooves us to say, I mean, he, he's training right now. So he has like that part. We're assuming he has that mm-hmm. part of the equation down. And that's why we're thinking of these accessories well, that he well, could add in. It's, it's something people don't think about. And in triathlon, when you're doing double days, mm-hmm. oh my oh, goodness. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I look back. I wish I knew what I knew now back when I was like 24 <laughs> or whatever. And I did this stuff because <laughs> I can look back at so many workouts that I was doing and I would slog <laughs> through them. And I had this feeling of being completely drained because you were, and it was a low blood. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And then I would, I would think I, I remember I do this like 90 minutes swim in the morning. I'd climb Geiger, which is 40 minute climb and 90 minute ride. And then I would run seven miles at lunch and I would have McDonald's three times that day because <laughs> I just needed like tons of calories. And yeah. I would be like, I just need, and, I, and I'd get, you know, two meals there yeah, and hungry stuff. All the time. But imagine if Sugar I did that craving. with real food, oh. like and ate all that. Oh, that would have been awesome. That's what I'm talking about. Ah, okay. It's my turn. With all of that stuff out of the way, let's get into the fun discussion around the little bits and pieces. Well, I did. So the actual hardware. These, these, no, these, (laughs) these guys wrote down two things. I wrote down, I think 14 things. (laughs) Okay. Number one thing. 13. This goes without saying uh, trainer wrote subscription. And Doug's doing that. Good job, Doug. Good job, Doug. Second thing that most Mm -hmm. triathletes need, unless you were a collegiate swimmer or a great high school swimmer, Get swim lessons. So uh, can I bring something up on that yeah. really quick? It's it's a bit intimidating, like on the swim lesson side of things. Like I feel like, and this is because I'm uneducated on the matter. Um, in a couple of years, I'll, I'll learn more about this. But I feel like uh, it's like, okay, I go and get swim lessons. So I'll be with kids in a pool, like with floaties, or I'm going to have to jump in with a master's swim group. And they're just going to be like, do yep. this, do that while I'm just floundering around. There's two. What's the middle ground? Well, there's there's different things and there's different price points. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say three different things. One is um, masters, and in Reno we have a great masters squad. And depends on where you live, you might or might not have master squad, which is basically it's like a national association. They have competitions and stuff. Mm-hmm. Sounds really fun. It's co- it's kind of like bike racing. You get to go travel and race at different distances. <laughs> yeah. And and in ours, for there's ski racing too. I yeah. plan on doing that at some point. There's national champs in the pool and stuff, but they have different lanes for different speeds. And what they say online is you just have to be able to swim from one length to the end, like 25 yards at a time, and they'll help they'll you. They'll work with you. Yep, and they'll work with you. And, and what, they do. This is real. Exactly. They, yeah. they do too. And normally those coaches are so bored because everyone else doesn't need any help. They're just doing their workout. <laughs> and they sit up there for like 90 minutes and watch. I used to be a lifeguard for a collegiate swim team. Yeah. It is so boring because no one's drowning, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I've seen in this is you go and you say, hey, could you give me one thing to work on for this, this session? And they'll watch you for a little while. You come up and then they give you that. And then you do that and you ask them again. It gives them something to do, gives you something to do. Yeah. It takes a while. It's also motivating to be with other swimmers in the pool because you don't realize how slow you are until you're with real swimmers. And then you're like, hmm. like there's two ways to do that. You can go home and cry or you can yeah. say, this is where I could be if I adjust my technique. And really, 90% yeah. of the time, it's not your fitness, it's your technique. Mm-hmm. Should you worry about like slowing other people down in lanes or because that's nope. like a concern that you I would go, have? You go um, – so you, you're in the slow lane, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then usually what you do is called circular swim. And so you'd be the last person that sends off. And usually they send off in five-second increments. So someone will say, let's say you're doing 100s, and they'll either say with, with a certain amount of rest or they'll have times per lane. Mm-hmm. And well, the first person goes off, and then you're supposed to wait five seconds. You look at the clock, the next person goes off. So there might be five people in a lane, and you'd be the last person to go. And if it's a 100 or a 50, you're not getting lapped. Like mm. no one's going to do the 100 in the time that you do a 50. And if it's something longer, like a two, three or 400, they'll come up and they'll tap your feet. Okay. And then you just wait at the side of the pool and you let them pass. And then you come in again, you, you look for an opening and go. Okay. But usually you're so slow. You're so happy when someone taps your feet because you're <laughs> like, I get, <laughs> ah, yes, I get 10 rest. seconds of rest. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. a lot of those times too, at the beginning, you can't finish the workout because oh, you're sure. Again, you are so inefficient at swimming mm-hmm. that uh, that you get so much more tired than other people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even fast people, you could you still might just have a great aerobic system. There's like always something to gain. So mm-hmm. swim lessons. The other two levels, there's swim clinics, 
which are awesome because that's always, there'll be like a triathlon swim clinic or something like that. It's adult based. Open water often? Um, usually it's in the pool. In Reno, we're lucky. We have a, a national open water swim champion, mm, like nice. elite level, mm -hmm. and he teaches clinics every weekend at that's Lake Tahoe. Awesome. Um, but this is, it's all adult focused. So that's great. And that's usually over a day or two. Okay. The other one is private swim lessons, which is also good. And normally they'll just go to a pool, um, and you'll just take a lane and the person will watch you the whole time and just give you feedback. That's the most expensive option, but it's, it's the most like so solely focused on you. So would you recommend like for the first option on getting in on that, like going to a master's swim type of a deal, if you have something like that available? I would. I, I, I mean, I would do the master swim thing and the swim clinics. Okay. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and if you're really bad, like you can't swim down the lane. Private lessons. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Cool. The master swim environment is a really embracing one. Really encouraging. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. It, all triathlete. I mean, these are swimmers. You say you're a triathlete too. Everyone's like, hey, buddy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I don't I don't know how to describe it, but they're like, you need some help. Come with us. Like, you know what I mean? Like, but we'll <laughs> help you. Like, it's, like, it's like how cyclists treat triathletes too in some respect in that Nicer. Regard. Yeah, nicer than that. Good. <laughs> yeah, cyclists can be kind of mean, huh? Um, Another one that people don't think about, and there's only a few people that do this, but running lessons. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's just because you can, it's just like thinking just because you pedaled a bike when you were a kid, you can ride a bike well. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some really ugly running. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's, it's probably irreversible at that point. It's not, I mean, it's not something that you can retrain so easily that it merits the effort. Mm -hmm. But, you know, gait analysis and, and yep. an actual run coach, and, not and a you've, bad way to go. I've seen some big some big tr like uh, changes in, in professional triathletes and how they run. If you look at, you know, mm -hmm. years past and mm -hmm. then watch the years tick by and watch <laughs> how their technique changes and hopefully efficiencies in improving and all that. Is that the point with like the running lessons? Like it's all about efficiency. efficiency, right? It's all about efficiency like swimming. Yeah. And there are some, I know there's one in, um, in Boulder, Bobby, I forget his last name, but you can pay them, pay him like money for a half day private lesson. Hmm. So if you've got that money, you could fly to Boulder, have a, a half day or two half days. Oh, Bobby McGee? Is that that's, yep. Yeah. Who's a very famous mm -hmm. uh, running coach. Mm -hmm. I, that's actually a gift that I want to give my wife here pretty soon. So hopefully, hopefully she, she doesn't listen. <laughs> yeah, but um, <laughs> right? That's cool. Cause, That'd be you know, awesome. I, I, experiences are better gifts than things, I think, yeah. for like I everyone over the age of like 14, yeah. right? Yeah, Maybe sure. 12. And for those of you that may not think this is impactful, I when I watch a runner that knows how to run, it's beautiful. Oh thing. my oh, gosh, that's cool, yeah. right? Yeah, like even there's there's a local Xterra uh, multi-time, I think world champ Xterra. I know national Age group, champ for world sure. Champ. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt Balzer, and whenever I watch him run, I'm like, I don't look like that. Like no. I look. Scott Young's the same way. I mean, yeah. he's, he's the guy who coaches the Masters class at, yeah. the, at the pool that we go to, and it's. Uh, when you see a fluid, efficient runner, it is a thing of beauty. Yeah. Brandon, really who is here. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So g now getting into actual equipment, uh, the number one thing for triathletes is getting a good tri skin suit. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, right, I don't know this for sure, Google this, but I think the Pearl Azumi one right now is the fastest, but look around. Hmm. It probably is going to matter, but there are so many different ones and so many people have bad ones. Hmm. Yeah. Um, find a skin suit. If you're doing longer distances, try to find one that you can go to the bathroom into. Mm -hmm. But I would still argue it's easier to take your shoulders off and go to the bathroom than to have to like push 20 extra walks the whole bike leg. Yeah. Because at least you're resting when you're taking yeah. your shoulders off. Um, I wrote down shoe covers or overshoes for triathletes. That's not. That can be complex. Yeah, but for. You definitely don't want to be sitting there in transition and then having to uh, try to put velo toes on. Those things are. Yeah. <laughs> but for non, <laughs> non cyclists, I have, uh, for those looking live, I, I brought some in. Uh, the velo toes are like a piece of rubber. They're, yeah, they're latex. They're yeah. rain guards. Mm -hmm. Yep. So these just go over your shoe and they're basically like a. Just a tight thing to go over your shoe to Neoprene aerodynamics. Housing. You have to, to, when you put them on, just a pro tip, pull, you pull them, you take your shoe off, first of all, and you pull shoe them. Shoe off, sock on. Mm -hmm, pull them up onto your calf uh, into the, the height in which you hope the, or want the top to stay. And then you bunch the foot part, you pull the foot part all the way up so it's sitting in the same it's spot. It's basically up on your a, calf. a ring of rubber around your ankle. Yep. Then you put your shoe on, then you stretch the rest of it over your shoe. And, and just be prepared to work. <laughs> yeah. I have a. Uh, the drag two zero, yeah. uh, over shoes and they actually have a zipper. Ooh. They're kind of like vinyl. Hmm. I like these. We didn't, I really want to test all of these outside. Those we I haven't like, had a chance. They were designed by Simon smart. Hmm. I yeah. It says smart on it. Yeah. He's, right? uh, he's been, he was behind a lot of envy design, a lot of stuff for years. I don't know if he still is. Then there's the no pins arrow coach over shoes that also have trip socks built in. So huh. these, uh, 
that's another option. Interesting. Um, so with triathletes, I saw at Kona once for an Ironman, people put like the small, like a quick overshoe on. Because mm-hmm. I think this smart one, you could put on pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you're going 112, like I, I'd still argue that it's so much easier in transition after you swam to sit down for 15, 20 seconds and get those on. But I bet, I bet you get both on in 20 seconds if you practice. Mm-hmm. And then taking them off, add on another five seconds per side maybe. Yep. Yeah. But then all the time you would save you on might, the, the Ironman, which amounts to what? You have data on that? Uh, no, but it's, I mean, it's going to probably be minutes and it depends on the person too. That's the thing with shoe covers. It's the angle at what you're in, it, the angle of your foot changes how that's actually going to affect even and the your shoe, shoe that you're wearing yeah. underneath that shoe yeah. cover will the affect cleat, it. The pedal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it also is you, you don't have to then whatever the, let's say it saves you five, 10 Watts. You don't have to output that. So that's right. going to come back on the run. Sure. Right. So that's mm-hmm. another part that people go, Oh, so if I, so if, if, if it was a wash, and you saved one minute on the bike leg, but it, it took you one minute, mm-hmm. and you're not at the very front pack where you need to be in this pack for aerodynamic drafting, you're gonna gain back energy for the run. Exactly so I think right. you're gonna be faster. Yep, and you'll be able to save some energy. Um, I'm going th- in these two in order of like price per um, redemption value, Chain yes. Road being the number one. Um, <laughs> yeah. We are the highest. Usually buyer. bikes are the the worst. Bike frames. Bike frames, yep. yep. Right. Yeah, the, it's in terms funny. of what it costs to save, a Drag. tiny bit of CDA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they CDA. say that the frame is actually a very small component of the aerodynamic efficiency package overall. Um, it's interesting. And, and I mean, that, that changes per bike, per person, all that stuff. But it's not as high as people not think. Not much. Yeah. Um, aero helmet. Uh, Heats probably has an aero helmet. Huge. And that's very individual. I would say, too, uh, aero testing. Because if, if he likes mm-hmm. his position, he could go to where we went in L.A. Yeah. And just test equipment, right? Test a bunch of different yeah. aero helmets. Totally. Uh, Bars, yeah, bar what, position. What did, so Andrew was with us at the at the velodrome mm-hmm. down there, and he went from a CDA of what to what over the course of numerous trips to say, the tunnel. Or the, I want to say velodrome. at the end he was 0.22, and at the beginning he was like 0.25 or 26. I'm sorry, Andrew, I'm not sure, but I remember at the end he was 0.22, and I was like, that's low. That's really low, and yeah. he is tall. Yeah, he's not a small guy. Yeah, he's, he's like bigger than six, I am, and he's, and he's two, more six, four, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's yeah. not more arrow than you. Well, they don't no. aren't near. He's no, he's close. not. So. He's 20, 20 watts slower than you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess that's true. Okay. okay. Um, the next thing that we're just getting into are optimized chains. Mm-hmm. So there's there's waxing your chain and then there's optimized chains. Mm-hmm. Premier Tactical makes a like optimized chain where I guess they like polish each link. Mm. It's supposed to be faster. That makes sense to me. Um, Andrew told me seven watts, which seems... Seems like a lot. Amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's um, there's also an optimized chain from Molten Speed Wax mm-hmm. and they do something, they have different levels of it. They have one optimized chain that they say they um, they optimize it to a point where it's good for like a hundred miles or two hundred miles, but after that it'll get a lot worse. Because they have to break it in a certain amount, and then there's this sweet spot where it's just an amazing chain and then it goes bad again. Wow. And they'll do that all for you. So that with the wax chain, if you got that much money to spend. That's Save good. that chain for your races. Sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, pedals. Get arrow pedals. Yep. Uh, we we were doing the speed play. Speed aer- plays. Uh, yeah. The arrow zeros. Aero. I'm not sure the exact name, but they're they're the zero pedals, and they have an one side of it is like a dimpled golf ball that goes yeah. flush with yeah. the cleat. So it's not a dual sided pedal. Yeah. Nope. Sadly. <laughs> Obviously, then I mean tires. The, you spend some money on on Huge. good fast tires for race tires. Tires uh, that match your your wheels. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're yesterday, Chad and I did a pretty. It was a blustery ride in yeah. spots on some descents, and you've got some twenty eights on some rims and some revolves. I just grabbed a tire and slapped it on, and it it was the wrong tire for the rim, and it it, it made a huge difference in the crosswinds. Yeah, like unnerving. it was more pushing. Oh yeah, because yeah, it, wow. it, it, it bulges far beyond the pro- profile of the rim. So if you're dealing with like something like a, you know a triathlon and you have a mismatch on that tire and that rim for 112 miles or 56 be, miles, even yeah. bleeding time. Yeah. So yeah. we bought um, we have like uh, calipers mm-hmm. so you can really tell the width of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because 25 isn't necessarily 25. It's totally dependent on the brand. So one thing I would do is I would ask the manufacturer. What, what kind of width they want. And on the Envy wheels, I think 25, they 25. say? 25. Yep. And we have the Victoria Corsa G Plus Speed, yeah. which is a very extremely low rolling resistance. Yep. We have a setup tubeless, which also saves you watts over butyl and latex. Yep. And those measure 25 on those Envy ones. Yes, yeah. they do. Um, really nicely. I know uh, Flow. It's like a perfect transition. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
flow wheel it's it's like the i think flow is probably the best value for the money wheels yep. and envy is probably the overall best, fastest. fastest yeah fastest yep um so two with flow contact them they'll email you back in like a day be like what's the fastest tire mm -hmm. for this kind of thing and mm -hmm. you can probably even tell them your weight and they will tell you what inflation pressure because yeah. they're, they're like totally into that yeah um they're so, geekier than we are yeah, yeah exactly you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> um that's that's my list but i would you know arrow wheels it really depends on the wheels right because totally and, and depends on how much uh money you want to spend on it yep yeah absolutely that's a lot of stuff for triathlon um, let's go into the last question for today before we go into questions that you've sent in, if you're joining us live right now on YouTube or Facebook. So if you're joining us live, stick around after this question, and then we'll answer those ones. Um, this one's from Brian and he's talking about antioxidants. Uh, he says, we've talked about this before recently, but we figured, uh, we can revisit this one because, uh, it's a common question. He says, thanks as always for a great podcast. I had a question regarding antioxidants, uh, place. So their place in post ride recovery. I found multiple sources saying antioxidants immediately following exercise can have a negative effect or negative impact on post-ride recovery due to their anti-inflammatory effect. And, uh, can you, I guess, clarify what that, that whole concept is? Cause yeah. people like constantly think the inflammation is bad. So why would it be yeah, bad? So it's not, it, it's not bad. It's how the body responds to stress or, or damage. And, and it's, it's part of the healing process. So when we impede that or in, influence it in, in ways that are outside of what nature intended, you know, we, we're basically kind of steering the train off the tracks. It's not, we're, we're interrupting something that is kind of already worked out. So just, gotcha. just leave the process alone. At least that's, <laughs> that's the argument behind it. Okay. Gotcha. He says, uh, typically I work out in the morning. My breakfast consists of a large smoothie, roughly 30 minutes following the workout. Among other ingredients, the smoothie includes about a cup of berries, as well as a full serving of kale which are higher in antioxidants. The smoothie is part of my larger overall approach to a healthy lifestyle, but should I be concerned about the negative impact on the, of the antioxidant rich foods during this period immediately following a workout? And, and Brian, we discussed this a, a couple podcasts back in greater depth. And, and the gist of it was that there's, there's as much science to support it as to, to uh, weigh in against it. Um, but regardless of that, this is another situation where seeing the, 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 broader picture is just the, 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 at least my recommendation, I think the recommendation of both Nathan and, and Jonathan and that general health is, is the bigger get that's what, that's what we're after. So a healthy body is going to be far more capable of becoming a, a more athletic body. So start there, regardless of whether or not it affects your, your, uh, uh, adaptive response over the course of your recovery mm -hmm. is, is again, it's, it's, it's icing on the cake. I mean, it might be sprinkles on the icing on the cake. It's just one of those gets that you worry about when you can, when you need to worry about that stuff, most of us aren't, aren't there. So address general, uh, health mm. before you start worrying about stuff like this. Do the, do the studies and I don't, I've only heard it. I haven't read them. Do they say that actually like they, they put athletes and some athletes didn't like it impeded their performance or is this more like in theory, it and, should do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, do you know? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We the, should look the, that up. That's the more I dug into it, the harder it was to draw any real, I mean, the consensus wasn't there. And, and then the findings were so polluted with, with other variables that it was hard to you know, nail it down to any one thing. Um, sometimes the data pools were small. Sometimes the, the design study itself was flawed. There, there was just nothing there that was so convincing that it was like, you know what? I'm not taking any oxygen after my workouts anymore. Yeah. And so what you're weighing is some kind of improvement in performance versus cancer and living longer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? Sure. I think it's easy to pick which one. Yeah, yeah. and, and extra exercise elicits or inflicts on us oxidative stress. So why not combat that with some antioxidant measures in, in highly natural forms, which is what Jonathan is going to list in a minute here. And yeah. all of, um, I've never read a study too that's, that says exercising makes you live less, right? Yeah. Exercising yeah. always, always <laughs> yeah. makes you live Extends longer life. and reduces cancer and, and heart disease and all those sort of things. The other thing I want to say is, um, because to me, I always want, you know, gains and mm -hmm. stuff, but I've had my biggest gain period when I've eaten the most fruits and vegetables, which <laughs> are high in antioxidants yep. all the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's to the point where like you might read this cause it's always the percentage, right? Like is it, is this going to stop me from getting better at all? Am I not going to have any inflammatory response and my body's not going to get any stronger? Yeah. Well, I would argue in my N equals one study that that's not true. Mm -hmm. Is this going to, you know, at the end of the 40 K TT, am I going to be a quarter watt slower? Maybe like, we don't know. You know what I mean? I want to know the, 
yeah. the magnitude. It's hard to pin down. I, mean, and there, I don't know how you can. But yeah. there's so much evidence on the other side that doing this stuff prevents cancer. Right. Which is scary, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. Should be a strong enough argument in and of itself. I'd rather lose the 40K TT challenge to you guys and, and not, not get cancer. Yeah, exactly. Or have <laughs> yeah. cancer when I'm older, you know, yeah. postpone it or whatever. Yeah. I'm just, there's, there's so many foods with antioxidants in them. So many of them. I'm just going to roll through some that I usually see used in like a, in a, like a post-workout recovery drink sort of a thing. So then you can understand the context in which we're actually talking about berries. Those ones are very commonly referred to as the ones that, that, that have the antioxidants that people are shooting for. Um, um, mango, apricots or apricots, forgive me, uh, spinach, parsley, milk, um, lean meat. If you're that type of person too, red peppers, uh, you can get down to different forms of tea, having plenty of antioxidants, all forms of citrus, almost all forms, I should say apples. Uh, then you get into all the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, leafy greens that you have corn, uh, so many different things that you can. And, and if you've recognized a theme here, it's that these are all, all come from natural sources, not mm -hmm. not refined or uh, bottled or. Uh, yeah, exactly. Artificial, I guess. Chicken I nuggets know. isn't on the list. <laughs> well, I'm just saying we're not <laughs> we're not talking supplements not. here. We're talking actual food. <laughs> yeah, strangely, it's not. Um, kiwis, you can find stuff in there. Vegetable oils, nuts, avocados, uh, seeds, whole grains. Beans. A ton of stuff. Beans. So, yeah. like, th th this is all really good food. And I, my argument is if you have that sort of food uh, properly implemented into your diet regularly, <clears throat> I bet it's going to make you a, a, a more healthy person and thusly a faster athlete overall. It, like, like, let's say that, you know, it's going to uh, impede some inflammation after your workouts. I don't know if that is enough to counteract the benefit that you would get from actually having a properly structured diet like that. It, the in general for like veggies the darker the color the more antioxidants yeah, yeah. for potato like potatoes versus sweet potatoes micronutrients get, yep get the darkest things um berries get them dark plums get them right nice and dark yeah um, absolutely those, that like if you don't have you don't want to google everything you eat and you yeah. got a choice between something that's light and something that's dark eat the darker one yep yeah, yeah couldn't agree thumb. more all right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the podcast. If you're with us live, remember, stick with us and we'll answer some of the questions you've submitted throughout this podcast. If you're just joining us on the podcast, thank you so much. And remember, you can submit your questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Live stream time. Oh, I don't see. know why I said goodbye to the audience because they are still here. <laughs> They're still here with us. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Say goodbye to the listeners. <laughs> but I looked at the camera. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, did it I'm not did clear it. on when to do what. <laughs> <laughs> not sure what to do with my hands. Um, okay. We've got one here. Ah, I want to become a top-level sprinter. Want to. But need to be uh, able to time trial in order to contend in GCs. Any, or any advice on balancing the training between sprint training yeah. and then time trial? Yeah, just uh, focus on being a time trialist and, and, and throw in some sprints. You need surprisingly little in the amount in, in terms of sprinting. In fact, just yesterday, um, we're going up Geiger grade, and I did two, six, maybe eight-second sprints up it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not hard to insert these. They don't really come at the expense of, of what the workout's primary objectives are. Um, you can do them any time. And then of course you can devote actual workouts to sprint training. Mm -hmm. Um, those are the ones where you do where you're as fresh as possible. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a high level of muscle recruitment and you want to do that when your body is primed and ready to let you have access to everything on board. And the types of workouts we've talked about before are, you know, big gear mashing, starting from a stop and winding up a big gear. Um, basically anything that influences a really high force demand or exacts really high force demand, uh, on the muscles. Mm -hmm. And, um, puts out a lot of power. So, yeah. so, so it's not hard to supplement your, your time trial training or your stage race training, mm -hmm. um, with, with some sprint work. And, and really, I think a lot of GC riders neglect it. Um, often enough, you know, high level teams, they've got a team built around it. They've got a, a guy devoted to sprinting, but for, you know, categorized riders, especially lower categorized riders, you kind of have to be good at everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so many riders don't address the sprint end of it. And it really doesn't require that much training to yeah. foster a reasonably good sprint. So sprint. why not, why I not have to. that arrow in your quiver? And if you are training to be a time trialist, you can be a sprinter's worst nightmare when you come down to the end oh, of that yeah. race and you have steady power. Well, and that's, and that, and that's, you know, that's like probably that's, the best argument for it. I mean, if you're a guy who can get off the front, stay off the front and you, you, dra you drag other riders with you, then it's a small bunch sprint. 
Wouldn't it be great to have the confidence that you can win that small bunch sprint? It's awesome. I've, I've actually, that's been one of the tactics in my brain for beat Pete is if I like, <laughs> I, we got to like get Peter Sagan to teach me how to sprint or something, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but then not tell Pete, Pete, I hope you're not listening. <laughs> and, uh, I think he is. <laughs> no, he's traveling. And the podcast is done. So he, he may not, he might not get to this point. It's a true story. Uh, but if I could sprint, cause he, I know he thinks, and right now he can just destroy me in a sprint. Yeah. Right. So that'd be great because he would think, oh, yeah, I can go as hard as I want because there's no chance that Nate can beat me in a sprint. And if I out sprint Pete, that'll be the, the best day ever. He's pretty darn good in the flats too, man. Well, he's good at everything. Um, yeah, he's good at everything. If you actually want more information on this specific topic, Liam, uh, 147, that episode that we did with Pete, has a ton of information on that very thing. So. Um, somebody made a, uh, a design for uh, Team Nate shirts. Oh. So if you look at it. The front says trainer Nate logo says, says team Nate. <laughs> and on the back says Nate says turtle. And instead of results driven training, it says gotta beat Chad driven training. <laughs> That's accurate. I like that. That's funny, man. Oh, you guys are awesome. That was from Jared. Thank you, Jared. Yep. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, Talon says, great show, fellas. I've discovered this year that my max heart rate is 10 beats per minute lower than it was last year. What gives? Uh, it's probably hasn't fallen that much in that, that limited span of time. It's probably fatigue. You're, you're mm -hmm. checking your heart rate or maybe you're in a constantly cooked state. This is not the most uncommon thing. Um, I read something just today that, rem um, I, I read years ago where I talked about athletes, especially triathletes get so used to being fatigued that when they start to feel fresh, it kind of freaks them out because it's, because <laughs> it's not their normal. What's going so, on? so what do they do? They address it with, you know, more work, more fatigue. They get right back to where they were and it's like, okay, everything's right again. Mm, yeah, that makes mm. sense. Um, Mike asks, how do you guys train for rides with 10 K feet plus climbing in some sections at 20 to 30%? Mm. It's a common one we get. Yeah. And, and we typically say gearing. And then, you know, if, if you're going to be forced into slow force repetitions, actually practice some slow force work, mm. it does have its place. And it really, it's just, I mean, powered weight ratio, right? Because oh, yeah. the, the yep. higher that is, the easier everything's going to be. Yeah. So if you can ditch some weight, ditch some weight, whether it's on your bike or in your bottles or off your body. And number and one is higher FTP. Yeah. Or raise your FTP. Yeah. 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 I mean, the other end of that strength to weight ratio. Yeah. In terms of like the specific training, uh, it, it has less to do with the amount of climbing you're going to have at the end of the day and more about how that climbing is actually earned throughout the day. Right. And I see like you could be in a situation where you're doing a ton of short, really punchy, steep climbs that just mm. over and over and over, or you could be doing something where it's a lot of sustained work with just a few steep spots. So that, that really changes. I mean, if you've heard sustained there, we have a sustained power build is one of our build plans. If you're doing a lot of sustained climbs, that's the type of work that you should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, climbing road race might be a good option thereafter or something like that. If it's going to be sustained work. Uh, but if you're going to be doing something that's, that's rolly and you're just going to get that elevation, I think like the Northern California foothills, like mm -hmm. that type of stuff, it's not particularly long climbs, but at the end of 10 miles, you've got way over a thousand feet of climbing just cause it's so rolly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how you're getting that elevation, just like in the distribution of that elevation too. So, I mean, mm -hmm. if you have long sustained climbs versus the rolling climbs that Jonathan's talking about, I mean, courses for horses, horses for courses, that whole idea, choose ones that suit your aptitudes, bigger riders with bigger FTPs typically do better on the longer sustained climbs where lighter riders with big strength to weight ratios, maybe lower uh, absolute watts, but big FTPs and a light frame do really good with accelerations and disrupting tempos and, yep. and, and riding those, those punchier climbs or, um, stirring up the, what would be a steady state effort on the more sustained climbs. Yep. Yeah, um, absolutely. Anthony's got a good question for you, Chad. Curious to why nearly all the VO two max efforts in general and sustained build plans are three minutes and under in duration. Is there any benefit to doing longer intervals at a slightly lower wattage, mm. say four to five minutes at 110 to 115%. Would that not increase maximal time at VO2 max? Yeah, yeah, it can. There, they, it, this is just another example of many ways to skin the cat. Um, there's a lot of data to support those two and three minute efforts. Um, the idea is to keep a high level of intensity and asking people to do a high level of intensity for four and five minutes is a harder sell than two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's the same way we're starting with 30 seconds, work up to a minute long, work up to nineties. Then you get into those two and three minutes, sometimes jump right into those two and three minutes. But the idea is to train the ability to maintain a high level of intensity. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, it's a hard sell when you're talking four or five minutes, people at the onset or the outset of a four minute effort that they have, they have to hold for 115%. It's a really daunting prospect. 
isn't you, um, you still skin you still skin the same cat in the end. Well, well, you do and you don't. Systems. I mean, we're we're trying to get to a high level of oxygen uptake, and and if you're not stressing your system hard enough to wind yourself up to that point mm -hmm. because you're dragging it out for five minutes, you may not get the quality that you get over a harder two or three minute effort. Mm -hmm. And doesn't repeatability increase too at that like three minute level than having the five minutes? Yeah, that's that's so another argument. It's, actual just, time. it's the whole basis of interval training. If we break it down into smaller increments, we can total more time at the intended intensity, mm -hmm. even though. You're only going through at a t at one point of time. You're going three minutes instead of five minutes mm -hmm. during the workout. You might get an extra ten minutes at VO2 exactly max that. Power. So so three five minute efforts versus five three minute efforts. You're probably pretty cooked at the end of the five minute efforts. Whereas with the three minute efforts, maybe you can tack on another one or two. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one's from Yo Jesh. I don't know if that's how you say your name. I apologize if I mispronounced it. He says, uh, I'm currently following a sweet spot base too. I want to know if I could do strength training along with the plan and and how sh I should fit it in with indoor bike training. Really common question uh, we've had. You can go onto the blog and there's a lot of information about uh, how to incorporate strength training. We even have a video on YouTube uh, that you can see and you actually put this comment on YouTube. So you can see those, those five exercises that, that Chad's recommended for cyclists and mm -hmm. plenty of other stuff. Um, but Ch uh, yeah, absolutely. You can do strength training, especially sure. in the base phase. Um, and then Chad, how would you recommend they work it in to the, to an existing plan, like matching it up on recovery days or doing it on easy no, days? See, I, I'm not a big fan of interrupting recovery days. So mm -hmm. the idea of, you know, doing endurance on one day and then tra uh, strength on the next back to endurance and just bouncing back and forth between those two really doesn't afford any legitimate recovery. Mm -hmm. And I know you're training different systems, same muscles in different ways, different fibers, et cetera. But the fact is fatigue accumulates and, and, and the, and overall quality starts to decline. So I try to put, um, a strength workout on the same day as another workout, whether it's an easy workout or an intense workout really doesn't factor into it all the time. It's more a matter of distancing them out over the course of the day, put, putting one at one end of the day at the other at the other, such that I can reap the greatest benefits out of each of them by give, by, by spacing them out because there are certain mm -hmm. signals, certain things that take place when you strength train that interrupt endurance adaptation and vice versa. Mm, that makes sense. Um, somebody asked when the first beat Pete is going to happen. So mm -hmm. things are starting to get real Oh, Real yeah. soon. Yeah, we're actually riding outside, <laughs> testing each other out. Yeah, Two weeks yeah, from yeah, now, yeah. you guys are going to get the Frank Town time trial. So that That's going to be a. And you're going to be out of town, right? Again, I know. I feel guilty. <laughs> and so what happened? We we booked our Hawaii, Hawaii vacation like a year ago. Yeah. Then my wife qualified for Boston, and that happens to be the same. Yeah, yeah like uh, like yeah, after. Yeah, after. So. Mm -hmm. I'm going to miss the first time trial, which is going to add drama <laughs> and not you, you guys can, it'll improve your, you'll feel better. Let me not be in there. Or so well, it's a seven minute, <laughs> a seven mile time trial, right? Yeah. Takes around seven minute, seven mile, seven, oh, mile. seven mile. Yeah. Yeah. It takes around 18 minutes, probably if, if you're, you're speedy. So 17, 18 for you guys, since you're so fast. Yeah. I think the course record is like 1630 cool. and that's like out of pretty much everybody's reach. No, 1545 um, from really? Rossi. My God. Okay. Yeah. Forget it. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's never Rossi. getting touched, <laughs> yeah. but you know, we, yeah. sh we shoot for like sub 18s, faster guys, sub 17 is Depends a lofty on, goal. It's a very windy. It could be a very, the conditions can change. And sometimes the 1730 can win the whole thing. Yeah. Sometimes a 16 minute wins the whole thing. I different days, different. 20. The wind out there is pretty <laughs> I'm telling you guys, jump guess. off the team Jonathan train. Um, it's not good. And then the week after that is the first air center crit. So that'll be the first time we're going to go against so Pete. three weeks. That's what we're saying. Yeah, pretty much. So I, I rode with Pete this Ish. past weekend. We had the drop ride, the really hard ride, you know, and uh, Dave and Brandon, the fast guys here at Trainer Road, broke away from us on the front. Uh, on the climbs and then we whittled it down to a small group but pete and i worked together thereafter pete is uh he was struggling on the climbs but dear me that man is a hammer as we yeah. chase through struggling on the climbs he's carting 210 pounds around exactly so he's right. working with a heck of a lot of power you put that it's guy amazing. on a flat flat run in oh. we, so. we, were, we were able to bring down a massive gap what i'm getting at here is this this affects the whole crit thing so well, yeah and and we were able to to chase down those two guys and catch them before the finish and it was a ton of work and pete did more work than i i was struggling to hold on then my poles weren't giving him a whole lot right he was much stronger there and once we caught those other guys there was a 600 watt sprint for a long time from dave like he went for a long bomb and pete went by him like he was sitting still so Pete's very strong. <laughs> and too, when we very when we strong, were right? having drinks at the Cliff Bar camp, Pete's FTP then was 340. <laughs> I was 345. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was like, how are you going to beat us? Yeah. Now, Sounds like you're backpedaling. Well, well, you see, the whole point of it too was like, how can somebody at similar yeah. FTP beat a whole team of six people who aren't dumb? 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so that, was, that was the premise. The yeah. premise was like, like at like the Pete's same. FTP was going to stay at 340 forever. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, that's what, that's what I was asking them. How could they beat? And, and I still don't know that question, especially with, with a whole team mm. of people who are pretty much as strong. Yeah. yeah. Now is FTP 365, 370. Yeah. That's a whole nother just he's fighting children, yes, right? Like Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. it's going to be hard. And I don't. I don't know if we're going to beat him the first time. We have dark horse Bryce Lewis in the room. <laughs> I have, I have. We've got good, some cars to play. <laughs> I know, but so how our season goes is we have these this Tuesday night race series. We have that, then we have a Merck style TT, which is a road, a road race TT, like a with a pretty good climb. Yeah, yeah it's, it's short, sure, but it's it's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, steep. it's it's climby. So like yeah. the, the overall course, it's it's rolling and has some steep climbs, but we can't use a TT bike. Yep, or so, uh, deep, deep wheels. Deep section wheels. Deep wheels yep. Either. Yeah. No clip on or aero bars, yep. 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 And then we have uh aero helmet? No, I maybe aero rope, but no aero helmet. Hmm. Um we're doing a, a hill climb TT, which is that forty minute, but if you're really fast, thirty minute climb. Mm-hmm. And then we have another criterium. That one I'm not gonna be able to race with you guys because that's gonna be USAC and Bryce Lewis probably won't race with you, maybe, but yeah. I won't be able to. Yeah. So you guys you will just be, be racing different f- categories. Yeah, I'll be saying. I'll be racing the five race and the four five race. I think I get to race you then. Yeah, well, we're teammates. That's right. Good fun. Um, yeah. And then the next Air Center isn't for a long time until June. So, so it's we'll get spread to see. Out. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to see. It'll be interesting. Um, let's see. The next question here, this is along the sprinting side of things again. It says, I'm working to improve my top-end sprinting speed to win flat-ish races. Hills chew me up. He says, he's I'm 165 pounds and I have a 260 FTP, and my max watts are around 1,400. So what are your training suggestions to improve my top end sprinting speed, uh, gym weight intervals? He says, one thing I would say is that if you're going to be winning flattish races with, and you want to improve your sprint speed, and I don't know if you're using sprint speed specifically, or if you just mean to improve your sprint, but I think a lot of people don't, they practice sprinting in a low gear and like really pushing hard against the, or in a high gear, really pushing hard against those and pedals. Stomps or windups. Yep. Which are very good. But then if you're totally unfamiliar <clears throat> with sprinting at a high cadence, and if these are flat races with fast run-ins. Downhill sprints work on your cadence. You want to be able to do that. That's one thing I would say. Um, have you, would you think gym work would, would help with this type of uh, an effort, I guess, Chad? Mm, no, I, it, it might, but I think time's better spent working on sprint drills. Mm. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure that's even what I'd address with an FTP of 265 and already a 1400 watt sprint. I think I'd be looking to find a better last lap flyer sort of speed or in a, in a road race, the, the 5k to go breakaway sort of effort, and then save that punch for a smaller group where, you know, 1400 watts is going to dominate. So I would just go about it different, uh, in a, with a different strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I would do the same. Erica asks, would you guys consider having a woman rider on the talk? To on to talk specifically about women's issues on the bike. There are hormonal factors that can greatly affect a woman's performance. Mm-hmm. It would be great to hear from an elite woman. It'd be super cool if we could get Stacy Sims. I don't know. I mean, that's that's a big get. Yeah. But, uh, she's got a lot. To say I was thinking too. Amber Pierce, maybe. Yeah. She's raced pro Amber. for Liz. Quite some time. ten years, maybe. Yeah. Liz, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Liz. Liz like, Lyles. Um, yeah. Retired pro triathlete now. Yeah. No longer. No longer. But yes, Erica. Yeah. And if any, uh, if you know of any uh, great female please. pros, please send them to us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Um, ah, th- uh, somebody said that level has gradual climbs. It also has steep climbs. So majority is gradual, yes, but some of them are quite steep. Uh, let's see. When is the best time to arrive at Leadville for your race? If you can't mm. get there three weeks in advance, uh, if you're doing the 100-mile race. We, we talked uh, specifically about that very Yeah, thing. we're digging into it, too. We're trying to figure out um, – so so we know that if you could show up as close to possible, as close as possible to race day, you stand a better chance of not suffering the effects of acclimatization, which basically is your body going through the adaptive throes of, you know, adapting to this, getting used to this higher elevation. And that seems to – in those early days, two or three days in is where you're, you're really getting hit hard with it, but you're also starting to bounce back from it too. So I think right now we're leaning towards showing up three days early, if at all possible. We don't yeah, know. We don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's, so. it's acclimatization sucks until it doesn't. 
and like like basically like the process that you go through when you're when you're acclimatizing and the things that happen to your body, those can be detrimental. Even though you're it's just another form of stress. Yeah, I yep. mean your body's it's, it's just more stress your body has to deal with. So it is going to pull on mm -hmm. your performance. That's just so how it works. You're basically trying to look at the 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 I guess the inverse variables that are working there, as in like performance is declining a bit, but then you might be getting the benefits of acclimatization. So you want to time that right. Common wisdom has usually said, and we're, re we're researching this common wisdom because we want to make sure that everything is, is checks across the board because we've seen conflicting stuff. But common wisdom is if you can't show up day of, or if you can't show up three weeks before, two to three weeks before, show up, you know, the morning of, or as close as you can to the race start. And then they usually say like the time frame within a week is the worst time uh, because you're suffering those effects. Of the yeah. Yeah. So, so Tim Carrison, who, I don't know. He was a pivotal role at, at Team Sky. I don't mm -hmm. think he's with them anymore. I don't know if there's sure. what his title was exactly, but when they would do their Tenerife training camps, uh, he would say on day one, the average difference between threshold at sea level and threshold at about 7,000 feet was 70 watts. By wow. day three, it was down to 35 watts, and then two weeks, no difference. Wow. So we're talking a long adaptive period, and in the early phases of it, it does bounce back rather quickly, but initially it's a pretty heavy hit. I wonder if any of that has to do with them like a riding too at the same time. You what know what I mean? mean by that? Like this isn't, they're riding every day. Mm -hmm. It's not like they rested for two weeks and then did uh, it. Yeah. Like yeah. does the riding happen? for that three day have any benefit? Yeah. And, and I don't know question. if they were riding at, at elevation the whole time or down at sea level the whole time, then just going up to elevation. Who knows? At Tenerife. You Sounds know. like, oh, I don't know. But you're at right. Tenerife, you're, you know, right. you're down low and then you can yeah. go up high. It's interesting, but, but that's, that's – um, so, yeah, there's some conflicting stuff. And we want to look into it to figure out what, what's really what. And I'm also, scared, bros. when you hear 70 <laughs> watts difference, remember that these are like Team Sky riders, so I bet they're dealing with – Yeah, like as, as a percentage – yeah. of ftp we're talking what maybe 15 well, 20 percent yeah, so they go from there i would assume yeah, yeah. 420 to 350 that's still oh yeah it's, it's a big oh, drop a yeah, yeah but i'm just thinking of people that have you know like yeah, 170 no, ftp period they you know they might not expect to see a 70 watt drop if you have 170 FP, ftp is what i'm getting yeah so stefan asks um i'm gonna paraphrase this question he's gonna do the, the the bc bike race which is a seven day stage race he's never done that so what, yep. So three weeks before he was going to do a two day stage race and then try to do a hard ride the third day. Okay. He's wondering to like practice his pacing, nutrition, recovery, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Great idea. He also though said he might sleep in a tent during it just to try to like recreate what it will feel like. It's not. He's it's wondering if it's like idea. too much stress, too close at three weeks out. Yeah, depriving yourself of oxygen over the course of your what what would be your recovery. Or no, 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 not no, sleeping, no sleeping in an actual tent outside. No, no, oh, tent, tent. Just tent. Oh, I got you. No, no, no. I, yeah. mm -mm, I don't think so. I think that's just, you're, you're beating the heck out of yourself and then you're hampering your recovery. Um, it, right now is about conditioning. I mean, deal with that when you have to deal with that. I, I don't know that I would inflict that on myself at the expense of performance improvement during training. Yeah. The only thing that you're going to be able to gain from the camping stuff in the tent beforehand is dialing in your gear or your process for camping. Just go to camping. To make it better. Yeah. Just go camping. I wouldn't yeah. do it after the three days. No. No. Because, and, and it, you'll be able to work out everything else you need to do to get a more restful sleep when you're camping when you're not completely worked from training. So that's what I would recommend. Um, look into like, uh, depending on if you're going to be carting anything around or, or the transportation side of things, but, but just it's expensive, but really, really go all in on getting proper sleep equipment. So... And what I mean by that is a sleeping pad that really does work. That isn't just minimalist. Or even an elevated yeah. cot. There's, exactly. There's a lot of ways to go that are can, not terribly expensive. You can get insulated cots these days that aren't going to cause a whole lot of heat well, loss. Which I think is at BC, isn't it like provided? So you'll have a tent provided. Mm -hmm. um, and then in most cases, they'll have sleeping bags. And that's the type of stuff that does not mean you can't bring your own. Okay. So if you, if you want to control those variables, I would not blame you at all. Um, mm -hmm. Something to consider too is waterproof stuff if you're going to be doing that because the camping you're in BC and yeah. you might be getting a lot of rain. Stefan's from that area. So I'm guessing he's used to rain and True water story. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, with that guys, uh, thanks everybody for joining us and we will be back at the, the normal time next week. Once again, uh, we appreciate you all and we're looking forward to chatting next week. See ya. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.